Hello, YouTube, and welcome back to another book review from me, your host, Logan Albright. And this week, I read The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad in this lovely Penguin Classics edition. Always a fan of Penguin Classics. Good to go back to them. They are well-annotated editions. These paperbacks, you know, they're not the most durable paperbacks in the world. They kind of get scuffed up easily. But uh, the text is always great, and the uh, curation is always great, and then the end notes and the introductions and all the other supplementary materials are always great on Penguin. So I have no complaints about that publisher. Now, Joseph Conrad, I only knew through Heart of Darkness. It's the only thing I've read by him. I know he's written many other novels that are famous, but I've only read Heart of Darkness. And I loved Heart of Darkness, but I read it a long time ago, and I kind of forgot about him. And then I was listening to Brandon Sanderson's Intentionally Blank podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts, and his co-host, Dan Wells, who's also, also an author, but I have not read anything by him, uh, mentioned that The Secret Agent was his favorite novel. And so I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I should read that. So I picked it up. And I read it. It's from 1907, and it's a very interesting novel. I liked it a lot. It's a strange novel, um, but I think it, it has a lot of themes in it and a lot of interesting things to talk about. So it takes place in London, 1907. This is before the Communist Revolution, um, and it's about these kind of communist slash anarchist radicals who are living and working in the uh, London underground, not the, not the metro, but not the tube, but, you know, the underground, of uh, political underground. And it's about a man named uh, Verloc, who is running a little kind of sordid shop that sells dirty pictures and stuff like that, and magazines and stuff. Um, and he is a, group of a, a member of a group of anarchists, and he is also working for this foreign embassy. It's never specified which country it is, but the guy who works for it is named Vladimir, so it's probably Russia or something similar. And he's working for them, uh, and they want him to basically cause, provoke some sort of incident, cause some kind of trouble, do some terrorist activities in order that the British government will take the threat of anarchism more seriously and do something about it. Um, and so he's kind of a, a nobody, but this is what he's involved in. And I'm going to talk more about the plot in a little bit with spoilers, but before I get to that, I want to talk about some of the themes in the book. Um, the Verloc is a, a shabby little man who's married. His, his wife's mother lives with them, and his, his wife's brother lives with them. And his wife's brother is sort of simple-minded, you might say mentally disabled sort of fellow who's not very innocent and very um, you know, naive and doesn't really understand what's going on, but a very sweet boy. Uh, he, you know, he's, a, he's an adult, but he acts like a kid. and His, his sister acts like a mother to him. Um, and he goes to these meetings of his club, and they have all these famous anarchists there and these... Uh, um, you know, revolutionaries and, and uh, uh, terrorists and bombers and stuff, and they never really do anything. They kind of sit around and talk and bloviate and pontificate about their plans, and I think one of the themes of the novel is kind of the feckless um, kind of impotence of revolutionaries and how they're all talk and they don't really do anything, and they're mostly just a bunch of uh, dissatisfied intellectuals who don't really accomplish their goals, and it's sort of pathetic. There's something pathetic about them. I feel like there's a commentary on the book about revolutionaries uh, being fairly pathetic. And then there's a commentary about how revolutionaries are tools of the powers that be. They're tools of big governments. They're tools of this embassy that this guy's working for. They're, being, they're basically pawns that are being manipulated by governments in order to try to get um, the governments to act in the way that the, the bureaucrats or the politicians in charge want them to. And so it's almost like the, the people who think that they're challenging the status quo are actually tools of the status quo. And I found that to be an interesting theme. And then a third theme is how revolutionary ideas uh, actually end up hurting like people who are innocent, people who are uninvolved, people who have really don't want anything to do with this stuff. And those are the people who end up getting hurt, which is why I want to go into spoilers now uh, for this book, because what happens, and this is fairly shocking and interesting, is about a quarter of the way through the book, um, Verloc is, is induced to get a, acquire a bomb and he's going to go and blow up the observatory because there's this idea that if you attack science, you're going to attack with one of the most prized institutions of England and this will cause a big uproar. Um, and he doesn't want to do it himself, so he manages to talk his brother-in-law, the simpleton, into doing it for him. And, um, and there's an explosion. Uh, but it's not at the observatory, it's just in a park. And the boy is blown to smithereens. Um, but you don't know that at the time. At the time, a quarter of the way of the book, they make it seem like Verloc himself was destroyed. And then only later do you find out that it was his brother-in-law that was happened. So like, it was pretty shocking about a quarter of the way through the book to think that the main character, who you've been with the whole time, is suddenly dead. Um, and, it, and then the reveal comes a little later. And there's this weird arc in the book where I think the first few chapters 
are almost comedy. I think there's a lot of funniness in it, a lot of satire, um, a lot of humor about, you know, these kind of buffooning, uh, these blundering revolutionary types and how they're, they don't really know what they're doing. And then it becomes very tragic and very serious after the death of uh, the, the band's brother, Everlock's brother-in-law. Uh, his wife is devastated and distraught and he becomes very somber and morose and the police are kind of investigating around, but they don't really care. Um, they, they, the police know who all the revolutionaries are. They're, it's not a secret. They know who these people are. They don't just they let them do what they want to do because they, they're not really threatened by them, which I found quite interesting. And uh, it's, it becomes a real tragedy, and it's actually very moving and sad because you have this complete innocent who abhors violence, and he gets upset when people are cruel to animals. He gets really upset when, like, a taxi driver is whipping the horses that are pulling the carriage. He's like, no, you can't do that. You mustn't be cruel to the horses. And he would never hurt a fly, but he gets talked into this, um, this scheme that ends up killing him, and it's, it's really sad that these innocent people end up getting hurt by these revolutionary causes. So I think that's a big part of the book. And then it goes from comedy to tragedy, and then almost to like horror movie, um, or horror, horror book rather, not horror movie, but it has a horror feel to it because the wife gets so upset and so distraught that she kind of goes nuts and goes on a rampage. And so that whole last part of the book is sort of um, everything descends into darkness and into madness, and it becomes really creepy. And I think the those kind of three different genres encompassed in one book is really interesting because you don't see that too often. So I found the jo- the voyage of reading it, the journey of reading it was really, really cool. Um, and something I don't experience too often. I, when I initially started reading it, I wasn't sure I was going to like it that much. Um, but as I got further and further along, I liked it more and more because it just kept developing. And I think Conrad is very uh, precise with his language. He's not a very flowery writer, but he is very effective at conjuring up the images he wants to create. I think he's a very good writer. So I enjoyed that a lot. It's interesting because um, Dan Wells, who recommended this book uh, through the podcast Intentionally Blank, um, calls himself a card-carrying communist, although he's not really. He's more of a socialist, um, um, which I'm not. Um, I am an anarchist, but I'm of the the non-centralized uh, anarchy kind of conception of things. I don't want government control. I want the absence of government control. I'm a libertarian anarchist. So we disagree on politics pretty strenuously. And so when I started reading this and thought the socialist is enjoying this book and it's about these, you know, communist and anarchist revolutionaries of the the kind of, you know, the communist version of anarchist revolutionaries, I was like, I'm probably not going to like this. But it seems to me that the book is sort of a critique of those ideas because the people propounding the ideas are pretty useless and ineffective and ignorant and they are being tools of higher powers that are using them against their, without their knowledge and against their wills for, to enact other goals. And they end up hurting people, and they end up failing in their goals, and they end up just causing problems for the people they love. Um, so that's not a very strong endorsement of these revolutionary ideologies. So I was a little bit surprised that Dan Wells was so positive on this book. But I, I really enjoyed it, so I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, fun is maybe not the right word, because it is quite sad and, and uh, disturbing towards the end. But it, it was uh, it took me on a journey, which I always appreciate writers doing. And I know a lot of other, a lot of Conrad's other books are about the ocean and seafaring, and I love books about seafaring. So I really want to go back and read some of his other books about ships and sailing and things like that, because that's a, a genre that I really enjoy. So if you, my loyal viewers, have any uh, recommendations of other Joseph Conrad books that take place on the sea that you think I would enjoy, I'd be very grateful for those recommendations. You can leave them down in the comments below, and I would appreciate that. Otherwise, if you like the video and you like this review, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the bell for notifications, leave comments down below letting me know what you thought. Um, I don't think I have anything more to say about The Secret Agent, but it ended up being a lot more fun than I expected it to be, and it ended up being a lot more deep than I expected it to be because it has a lot of sort of subtle messages about revolutionary politics that I found quite interesting and inspiring and good. So I enjoyed The Secret Agent a lot. Would recommend it to people who like this type of novel. Um, I did think it was interesting that like this all takes place before the communist revolution in Russia, and Marx is not mentioned in the book anywhere. And so this is—I didn't realize these ideas had such currency prior to the Russian Revolution, but apparently they did, and people were aware of them, and people were uh, writing about them. So that's pretty cool. So I recommend it. Um, let me know any other Joseph Conrad books or any other books of any kind that you want me to read, and I will check them out. Until next week, I've been your host Logan Albright, and thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.